So uh, my name is Ryan Ashley. I work with Charlie here in Cyber Reboot, and I'm going to talk about uh, some things that we've done going along with what he was just talking about with the ACLs. So, um, the idea is we're, we're monitoring all this stuff on the network and we want to find bad actors ultimately at the end of the day is what we're looking for. So, I mean, first off, we're, you know, we've got a couple of cases, right? Like something that looks weird can just be somebody getting lost. Like you're bouncing around a network. It's relatively easy to lose track of where you're at sometimes. So, but it might also be somebody who is, is genuinely up to no good. Um, so to kind of talk about that first, we should talk a little bit about like how the threat workflow works. And you've probably seen a graph not unlike this before. And they always put recon somewhere at the beginning, which I feel like is understandable, but kind of terrible because it's, it's actually something that like happens at a bunch of different places. You'll get somewhere and then you go back to that phase, right? Um, and that's important to know because fundamentally, like one of the issues is that we, if we want to find them, we want to keep them going back to that, that recon phase, because the longer they're there, the more time they spend just trying to figure out where they're at and what they're looking for, the less time they can actually <coughs> spend harming our network. Uh, and so recently our group has been doing a bunch of work around deception and, and trying to think about new ways to use that. I know it gets a bad reputation. First thing everybody asks me, you know, honey pots, it's a lot of effort for a little bit of payoff, um, which has historically been true, but I feel like SDN in particular really changes that equation because the ability to interact with the, the network, yeah, I did not mean to go forward. All right. Anyway, uh, the ability to interact with the network programmatically, it makes a significant difference there, right? Instead of having to go out and like set up an actual physical machine, monitor it, keep patched, that whole thing. So uh, why are we doing this now? I mean, one, like the things we're doing aren't working. This is this graph is from Verizon's most recent data breach incident report. And you can see out of all the breaches they surveyed, in something like 90 some odd percent of them attackers were able to achieve their objective in five or fewer steps which is just terrifying to me like absolutely terrifying but like that also gives us a good number to beat can we make them do seven things ten things like every extra thing they do is another chance to discover them to catch them to stop them um the the way we've been thinking about you know defense and configuration is purely, it, it, that's unsustainable. We, we cannot keep doing that. Like you, you hear on the news all the time that we can't get enough people in cybersecurity with the right skills to begin with. Uh, the industry has a huge problem with burnout rate. So, you know, we need to start rethinking the way our networks are designed and structured to treat that as like a design constraint effectively. Uh, we need to start moving towards intrusion tolerance in our network. And like I was saying earlier, um, SDN provides a, a great opportunity to do that. So I think that deception and SDN really work well together. I hit this kind of earlier, sorry. But um, right now, the way things are, like a human operator needs to find out something's going on. They've got to triage that. They've got to go track down the log, all that sort of thing. If we can get to the point where we are using automation to work on these, now all of a sudden, as an administrator, you basically have to ask yourself two questions. Is what I'm looking at a case of a false positive, right? Did the machine overreact to something? Or, and then, you know, if it wasn't a false positive, did it react sufficiently? Did it do enough? Is there more I need to do going on to that? Um, the, the key thing here, there is that like the whole point of machines, the whole reason that we build them is that they're very good at translating a defined set of inputs into a defined set of outputs, like a rule set based thing. So why are we taking highly trained, highly skilled networking people and saying, Hey, go parse these log files. And when you see X, Y, Z, you then go do X, Y, Z. That's like, that's a waste of time. Um, a waste of their time. And 
it forces them into basically perpetual incident response mode. They're not thinking about how to get ahead of the problem. They're dealing with yesterday. So um, this is just going over some of the same things that Charlie talked about yesterday in terms of, of how we've actually structured things. Uh, this is the same rules that YAML set up. Uh, the one thing I want to call out here, so what Charlie was talking about, the things that were applied automatically, you can see they have a set of keys saying, okay, when you see this thing, you apply this app. You'll notice this last one down here. It doesn't have these, right? So the only way this rule could ever be applied is if you specifically set it. That's what we want to do here, right? Instead of maybe you don't think that uh, you're getting correct results from the machine learning problems, you're having issues with false positives, or, and this is what I'm going to talk about, you want to federate data from other sensors and say, okay, I've seen something going on elsewhere on the network, and based on that, I want to trigger that. So... What I did is I created a script called Honey Sidon because everything in this space is named Honey Something, and I am terrible at naming things. Um, <laughs> that's just me being honest. So essentially what we do is even more YAML because everybody loves YAML. Uh, and what you do is you, you basically define an IP, a set of ports, you know, TCP, UDP, what do you want to listen? And then you can say, you know, this, this is the thing I want you to execute when you're finished, which is just a Python script that can do anything you want. Um, I'm using, I'm, I'm reading from Poseidon's API, looking at the data in there, and then doing responses based on that. But that's because that's what I have available right now, and that's what I'm interested in working in. This could be anything at all, right? If you want to pull down data from, you know, Nessus scans, you want to grab stuff out of like Splunk or some kind of, you know, SIM set of Anything that you can read data from and then react to with a Python script is, is fair game. And I think that's kind of the important thing here because that's we, we need to build, in general, better analytics, right? Start federating a bunch of different data sources and saying, instead of trying to treat any one thing as a single source of truth, say, okay, this is telling me this, this is telling me this, this is telling me this. So based on all of these things, let's react in a particular way. So as a neat side effect of this, because one, one of the other problems I've heard with sort of deception, pragmatically speaking, is you have to keep a significant chunk of the people operating on your network in the dark about it for it to be effective from a deception standpoint. So you've got to have very few people that manage it. And so as a practice, you end up with basically like a bunch of deception things over on one part of your network and then your actual network here over on the other side of things. Um, and then the minute somebody figures out that something is, you know, deceptive over there, like, oh, this is the bad area. And it's like, it gives away the game. Um, one of the neat things about the way we're doing this, because everything's automated, you could have, say, a, a web server, or a, you know, some kind of service of some sort. And this is just a little Python script that's running and listening on an arbitrary set of ports. It doesn't take a whole lot of resources. So you can have a bunch of real services running and a bunch of fake services running basically on the same set of IPs. And now it becomes much harder to sort out where, where the shenanigans begin and end. Um, and it totally messes with banner grabbing. Uh, you can do all sorts of stuff, like send out weird banners that don't make sense on ports that don't make sense. Send out the same banner on a bunch of different ports. Like, why would they be running that in all those places? That, you know, uh, Essentially, what you want to do is make the adversary much less confident in the information they're getting, uh, then they're, they're much less willing to act on any given piece of information, which again, just keeps them going back to that recon phase, keeps them trying to figure out where they're at and what's actually going on around them, giving you more chances to catch them in the act somewhere. Um, so this was... Uh, a scenario, let's just say we have a dev workstation. Uh, I was going to say it was behaving abnormally, but we're just going to use normal as equal to abnormal for the purposes of this demo, which hopefully works. We'll see. Um, but basically the idea is when it sees a connection on an SSH port, it's going to say, okay, we're going to cut off your internal connection. You can still talk to the wider network. But we're going to see if we can prevent you from, you know, doing pivoting or lateral moving type of activity there. So 
and then after that, monitor it to see what happens and if it returns to normal. So, worst movie ever. All right. So, go back over here. What? Address is already in use. Okay. Um, didn't expect that. All right. Well, uh, I'm not going to sit here and try and debug this. Um, I'm going to open source all of this at some point in the not too distant future. Anyway, you, you can try it out. Uh, at that. Uh, moving on. It's kind of, I don't want to. Wait, so we use lunch time. So, oh. Yes, thank you. There we go. Oh, no, no. Right. Really hate that. Let me do that. Okay. So some of the things that we would like to add to this to keep moving forward with this idea. Um, I'd like to take advantage of some of the new co-processing features that have been added in Faucet. I feel like from the standpoint of using Deception, there's a lot of fantastic opportunities there. Uh, and also some of the throttling things like you know, you, you think you see an attacker starting to exfil something, like how do they react if you suddenly slow them to 56K? What do they do then? Do they go somewhere else? Do they keep trying on that? Like, uh, so there's a lot of interesting things to do there. I'd like to be able to run this from a Docker container. Uh, there's a port mapping problem right now. So like maybe Docker Compose or Lazy Design. Docker can, can solve that. Uh, I'd like to play with sort of inconsistent service behavior, the idea of uh, idempotence, the idea that you do the same thing, you should get the same result every time. What happens if you start selectively breaking that? Uh, how does that play? So, but at the same time, as we keep going forward with this thing, we've got to keep a couple of important questions in mind. Like one, we need to adversarially test this, get some people who are better at this stuff than me and see if it really does do what we think it does. I mean, this is all ongoing work, so. And then two, does it, if we make things harder for our actual users at the same time as we make it harder for attackers, we haven't really done any good. Uh, so keeping the operational impact in mind is also always important. So with that being said, um, any questions? No, we haven't actually, but that's a, that's a very interesting question. I mean, I can see <clears throat> some sorts of applicability there as well. That's, that's a good idea. That I should probably add that to my list of things to, to think about and moving forward. So, um, if he can see Sure. Well, correct. Um, so, I mean, actually, like, tracking them down and tracing things back is kind of a fraught area, right? Because you, you essentially have a boundary problem. Tracing them back through your network up to a certain point, sure, that's fine. But once you've traced them sort of to the perimeter of your network or to the perimeter of your area of responsibility, tracing them further becomes sort of a 
a, a quagmire, right? Like you, you basically you're starting to move into things that are technically speaking the, the domain of like law enforcement types of operations. And there are a whole set of, of legal ramifications around that. So that's something you have to be very, very careful with. Not as yet. That's that's sort of part of the work that we're doing right now. We're this is this is the beginning of a, a whole project that we're going to be running over the next few months. That's that's based around exactly that, right? Like, what kinds of de if deception techniques can we deploy? How effective are they? Which ones work better than others? Sort of calculating the basically the ROI on it, right? Which ones are worth the effort? Which ones aren't? Yeah. I mean, I assume to a certain extent it's going to. Uh, that's sort of the nature of this whole sector. It's a proverbial arms race, right? Like, you know, people used to just send out very simple malware. Then we got signature detection. Now they start obfuscating it. Like, I, I don't think we can make that problem go away. Uh, but at the same time, like, just because some attackers are capable of value, uh, evading signature-based malware, that's that's not a good reason not to run antivirus, right? And it's it's the same thing. It's we're getting progressively finer and finer sieves, and so this is this is not going to replace anything. Like there are no silver bullets, there are no magic answers. This is just one more thing that you can deploy if it works for you. So, I think there was a question over here. Yes. So, it, it seems likely that uh, the deception techniques are are uh, you know might able to trick people who are sort of external attackers who aren't familiar, who can't easily differentiate between a legitimate service and a fake service. Uh, do you think there's a role for deception with kind of internal intruders, people who sort of already know the system and already can sort of, can probably regular users can tell the difference between a system that they connect to, like the regular payroll system, and some like fake So is there a role for deception internally and as well, or is it mainly for uh, I think there are roles for both, but you sort of have to think about them differently depending on, on what you're trying to catch, if that makes sense, right? So, uh, for instance, setting up sort of a, a fake payroll server or a fake mail server will work very well for somebody who has, you know, maybe fished somebody and come in that way. But yes, if you've got somebody who like logs in and fills out a timesheet in that system every week, they're going to know that they don't go to this other one. Um, so you're going to have to stand up something different to catch that type of internal threat. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all for your time.